Once you secure your model, uh, now you can actually operationalize it with the use of AI. And we focus on the six critical functions of cyber defense, which are incident response, threat detection, mission control, security validation, threat intelligence, and threat hunting. And what we ask for our clients who are interested in this is we would do a cyber defense assessment uh, within 18 months, or we can do it alongside the engagement and see where they're at in their cyber defense capabilities. Welcome to another episode of Mandiant's Defenders Advantage podcast. I'm your host, Luke McNamara. Today, we're going to be talking about some new services that Mandiant is offering, specifically the Mandiant Consultants, and who better to discuss these things than my guest joining me today, Mohammed Munir, Pat McCoy, and Trisha Alexander. So welcome to all three of you. Thank you for having us, Luke. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed, let's start with you. So we're going to talk about three different offerings, um, but these, I think, all relate to uh, security and Gen AI. I think security practitioners are an, at an interesting place with respects to security and generative AI. Um, increasingly, they're going to be called on to secure um, Gen AI workloads, Gen AI related architecture, as we see adoption across the industries that we serve. And additionally, there's a lot of potential security benefits to adopting that into their workflows. So we're going to talk touch on several of these today. But Mohammed, let's start with you. What is the, the particular offering that you're working on um, and this particular service line with respect to securing the usage of Gen AI? Thanks, Luke. So specifically, we're looking at exactly that, securing AI solutions. Uh, over the last year and a half, we are seeing the advent of different types of AI applications, tools that organizations are acquiring, adopting, developing in-house. Uh, and as, as is always the case, we, we want to try and make sure that security isn't playing catch up as, as organizations are developing these new capabilities. And to that end, we've developed this service offering that is taking a look at uh, the secure adoption of AI solutions. It's not just from the perspective of acquiring these tools, but even if an organization is developing those tools in-house or those capabilities in-house, we are uh, looking at the approach to do that in a secure fashion. Now, we're taking a multi-pronged approach there. We can get into that a little bit more. One thing that I'll, I'll mention here is we are basically seeing this landscape develop in real time. Uh, over the last year and a half, there's been a lot of misconception where organizations have uh, sort of as a result of hype in the media, as a result of a lot of uh, people making speculations on what these tools are. There, there was a bit of a skewed aspect as to, as to what these tools would end up looking like once they're put in production. That ambiguity is starting to erode now. That's that's going away as more and more of these tools are being adopted by organizations. So we're starting to see more use cases, more clarity around that. And as that clarity is coming up front, we, we are able to start planning security around those use cases. So you look at, I think, in some sectors and some organizations, the business side, the enterprise is maybe adopting these faster than security teams have been able to keep up with in terms of understanding how to architect and provide security for this. There's been resources we put out, things like SAFE, the Secure AI Framework. Specifically for this service line, what are the things that you are looking at and advising for those security teams that are now tasked with having to secure this additional infrastructure, this additional work? So the, the core concept for us here, uh, or rather the core approach that we're taking here uh, for organizations is number one, we need to understand what the AI pipeline actually looks like. We need to demystify the AI pipeline. So the best way we can advise clients around the security for their AI solution, specifically their own use case, is to understand exactly what that architecture looks like. Uh, a point of clarity that we had ourselves as we were developing the service line is, while the AI applications, while this capability is new, it's built on known infrastructure for the most part. Again, there are some nuanced elements that are different, even from an architectural perspective. There are certain types of technologies that are being leveraged uh, that were not being leveraged before, certain libraries that are being used. but for the most part, the architecture is known to us. And that is where we can start advising clients on continuing best practices, continuing to improve their security posture for existing infrastructure, because that has an impact on the AI pipeline. Part of that is devolving, again, understanding what that 
AI pipeline looks like. So deconstruct the AI pipeline. If we deconstruct the AI pipeline, we can then understand what are the critical components of the pipeline. That includes the model, that includes the different libraries, the tools that are being used, that includes the data that the model has access to. Uh, once we understand what the critical components are, we can start looking at controls, we can start looking at access controls, uh, and we can start hardening the environment as a result of that. So at a high level, our own approach, we start with an assessment where we try and understand sort of perform a gap analysis for the organization to determine where the gaps are in controls. Also, obviously, identify the strengths. We also pivot into threat modeling based on the information that we acquire from the organization. So, for example, if we can identify those critical components, we can start coming up with various plausible attack paths that may result in a compromise uh, for that environment. And then the third pillar for this approach is threat hunting. This is where we are able to come up with various hypotheses and hunt missions based on the scenarios that were developed during uh, threat modeling and validate whether number one, the right type of logs are being captured uh, and whether they're being whether they're present. And then of course, to try and find evidence proactively of, of any evidence of compromise. So it's a very holistic approach. It sounds like that you're taking um, with respect to security with this, uh, the application of controls, hardening, as you mentioned, this has been something we've done in a lot of other areas. Uh, for example, hardening, around a particular type of problem, such as ransomware. I'm curious, I mean, are there other areas when you think about risk reduction for organizations that, again, are already on this journey of, of Gen AI adoption, where uh, the services you're providing are helping to reduce that risk? Yeah, so I, I think one of the blind spots that we're coming across most often uh, with organizations that are in various stages of, of developing these capabilities is governance and framework, number one. That is where a lot of organizations have either not thought of what that ends up looking like for them uh, or are in the process of figuring out what, what kind of governance and framework they can come out with. So that's definitely one area that we are focused on and we're helping organizations already develop uh, governance frameworks, either for organizations that have already deployed or organizations that are in the planning stages for acquiring and deploying these types of technologies. Uh, the other thing I'd like to pivot into here is the secure AI framework, because our approach was sort of based on the secure AI framework in the sense that if you take a look at the secure AI framework, it nowhere does it say that you have to develop anything that new, and that resonated with our approach. The language that is used in the secure AI framework is expand strong security, extend detection and response, automate defenses, harmonize platform level controls, adapt controls to adjust mitigations, uh, contextualize AI system risks. So all of these, nowhere do we see anything that new being developed. The whole idea here is these are best practices. These are challenges that we are already trying to solve as part of our overall approach for security. We're just extending this to the AI pipeline. So that was our, our original uh, understanding of uh, what the security would look like for AI. And secure AI framework really just resonates with that. And I think there's a lot of ways where you're really operationalizing a lot of those core principles in SAFE in, in, an, in a particular service. Um, I should also ask, you know, there's obviously a lot of Gen AI solutions that across Google are being developed. Does this service apply to organizations that are developing their own AI solution? Maybe they're using a service, uh, one of, of Google's models, or they're using others. Where does this sort of apply based on what AI models and framework you're using? So first off, just to categorize the kind of organizations that we are engaging with to, to help with around this, we are engaged with clients that are in the pre-ideation phase. So for example, organizations that sort of had almost an embargo to say, we're not going to start adopting these technologies until we have a better understanding of the risk. For those organizations, we're very much focused on helping them with the governance and framework, identify the areas of risk so that they can plan mitigations. Organizations that are in the development phase is another type of organization that we're trying to help with. For those organizations, governance and framework, as well as threat modeling, sort of really help them understand how to develop the, the security posture to improve the security posture for their solutions. And then, of course, if organizations have deployed these solutions, then it's basically all three work streams. Now, many as a whole, we are platform agnostic in the sense that it doesn't matter if your solution resides in Azure, in AWS, or in GCP. But even if you are very much in the GCP environment, we can definitely help complement the security controls that are in place within GCP itself. If you think about it, when you adopt an AI solution, there are two ways that you can look at the risk. Number one, there is the risk to the AI solution that is posed from the infrastructure for the organization. And then there's the risk to the infrastructure that is posed as a result of the AI solution being adopted. 
Where we come into play is looking at it from the holistic perspective again. We're looking at the organization's infrastructure at large, and then we're trying to understand how that impacts the AI pipeline. So even if you're using Vertex AI, you're using Colab, you're using BigQuery, all of those components will have certain security implications from the organization's own infrastructure. And that's where we can really help complement the GCP approach. So that's a good segue, I think, Pat, into what you're focused on with the service line. And I guess, you know, if you're an organization that maybe you've already started down this journey, maybe you're building the plane in flight, you're either, you know, trying to kind of at that ideation phase, as Mohapin mentioned, plan things out uh, or develop, maybe further down the road now, you actually have AI systems in, in place, data in place that you're using for this, that you're training models on. You want to test the security architecture. You want to test the processes, the controls. Is that where your uh, effort comes in? Absolutely, Luke. I, I think, you know, the the best defense is a good offense in a lot of cases. And when I think about designing a defensible architecture or designing a system that accomplishes business needs without introducing unnecessary risk into process overall, Thinking about what's important to your organization based on the threat modeling that Muhammad and his team perform and using real world adversarial techniques to determine whether or not technical or process level controls that are in place are effective underpins whether or not a system can go into production and helps organizations measure real world risk or real world impact to attacks against these, these systems. So red teaming is not anything new for Mandiant. This has been something we've been doing for quite some time, specifically related to AI-related architecture. How do you go about testing the security of those defenses? What sort of approach are you taking? That's a great question. So I think to answer that question, I need to back up just a bit. When you think about AI, or when a lot of people think about AI, I've, I've found that I can separate those folks into Almost, almost two categories. Those who look at it as another computer or another system or set of systems that need to be defended, and those who look at it as a bit of a, a magical black box, right? I, I think back to early in my career, uh, I started in IT in the late 90s and started red teaming full-time in 2004. And when I started performing adversarial tests, many organizations did not have a philosophy for how to do patch config and vulnerability management uh, appropriately because everyone was racing to be first on the bus to get to market with scalable solutions and to beat out the competition it's the way most businesses operate right build it get it launched start generating revenue and bolt security on after the fact what we've learned in the last 20 years is that security can actually be a business enabler Thinking about security from the genesis of a solution through architectural reviews and threat models uh, that Mandiant can assist with uh, and baking security in from the start is the difference between good and great. Long-winded way of saying, when we think about securing these solutions, understanding you know, what is our client in the business of doing? What is the use case for this particular Gen AI solution or the solution overall? What are the various inputs or ways that users can interact with the solution? What is the data that the solution will be interacting with on the back end? Sort of using what we learned during the threat model to prioritize testing is step number one. Step number two is understanding that there's more than one pillar that should be thought about when attempting to secure a solution like this. Um, you have data security which is essentially any type of data that is part of the AI pipeline that's used to train uh, models in an organization is important. You might be using really sensitive data as a method to train the environment that you'll be operating in. If model security, that is to say the, the engine that the model runs on and the model itself uh, could introduce risk to the organization. You have environmental security, so that is to say the the series of machines or networks that house data that is used by the models or the models themselves or checkpoints related to the models can also expose the overall solution to risk. And I really think you need to look at all three of these holistically uh, in order to really answer the question, is this particular solution vulnerable? When you bring up data security, and I think 
you know, this will be something that'll be interesting to you know watch as we see more organizations adopt Gen AI. And when you think about sort of the threats that would uh, face an entity or um, a part of the organization that is housing data, we think about you know the problem we see with a lot of modern extortion, a lot of which has increasingly shifted to, to data theft as a means of extortion. I think about specific threat actors like Fin11 that has targeted file transfer services multiple times over. I think in part because that's one place where data resides. So when you think about, I guess, the sort of future threats that could emerge and feeding that into a threat model approach, do you think about it from the standpoint of how a threat actor might specifically target these systems? Um, Maybe to some extent, you know, the motivations driving it, the type of operation that they may be engaged with, or how do you take that sort of threat model approach and apply it to a problem like this? So when I think about data security, I think about it very similarly to how I think about any other type of data that lives in an organization. If a client of ours, for example, is trying to protect sensitive source code or trade secrets or financial data or healthcare data belonging to their clients, uh, all of the same basic tenets for protecting that type of data also apply to protecting data that is used within the AI pipeline. And so to that regard, when Mandiant tests data security for our clients, uh, we, w- we would basically define data used within the AI pipeline as a post-exploitation objective for a traditional red team. If I can compromise a developer that's responsible for building or maintaining this solution, or I can compromise someone who may be responsible for training the solution or otherwise interacting with it, I can gain access to data that many organizations are investing tons of time and resources into um, in the same way that I could gain access to source code or you know, PHI or PII or credit card data on a traditional red team. So when we're talking about red teaming for AI, data security is sort of the first pillar. Environmental security, second pillar, right? If I can compromise humans or I can compromise machines that have access to environments that this data is housed in, it could give me a way to exfil that data or access that data using the same types of methods that a threat actor such as Fin11 uh, may may use when targeting an organization specifically. Uh, But model security is what most of our clients think about when they think red teaming against AI. That is to say, can we get a non-deterministic model to produce outputs that are very unexpected. Can we attack the model directly, backdoor the model, and use the model to gain access to other areas of the organization? Um, Is the model and the solution overall implemented in a way that is over-permissioned, that, for example, would give us access to data that is unintentional? During active red teams, we've been able to convince certain models to give us things like usernames and passwords or access to uh, not broadly available internal documentation. And and this can be catastrophic to many organizations or can create the perception of insecurity for many of our clients uh, that is not desirable. So on model security, um, could you talk a little bit more about the difference between testing for safety versus security? Because I think a lot of times when people perhaps have heard about testing, you know, models, maybe they're, the use cases they're thinking of maybe are more in the safety bucket, but what you guys are specifically working on is that security piece. Yeah, hundred percent. Everything we do is biased towards information security. That is to say, you know, is your, is your data secure? Are your systems secure? Can an attacker gain access to environments that would put your organization at risk or position an attacker to extort you or leverage the access that they have uh, for financial gain or or, uh, uh, other types of gain. Um, When I think about safety issues, uh, issues that are more specific to harmful responses. So for example, large language models producing outcomes or outputs that are instructing uh, users how to do dangerous things or encouraging users to do things that, um, that, are, that are bad, committing self-harm, for example. So Luke, when I think about the difference between testing for safety versus security, I feel like testing for safety is really an N plus one problem. Taking a body of knowledge that could be extremely vast and determining whether or not an LLM, for example, is responding in an accurate way is outside the scope of the service that Mandiant provides to our clients. So responses that could be biased, 
responses that could be unfair or you know just patently wrong are things that matter to a lot of organizations, uh, but they're not directly responsible for securing data that's used to train models or data that models may have access to within customer environments that could result in uh, say meteoric impact to an organization's information security uh, in general overall. And so, you know, we bias towards things that could, for example, give us unauthorized access to data or give us the ability to um, gain entry to an organization, establish a toehold, um, escalate privileges and, and move laterally towards other uh, objectives that are that are more firmly in the camp of information security uh, versus uh, in the camp of safety, as you alluded to. Which, as I should note, we have, uh, you know, a lot of teams that work on the safety component, uh, especially with respect to our models. So keeping it confined to, to the Manding approach here. Um, and Tricia, you know, we talked about, you know, the first two kind of components of this service focused around the security of models, testing that security of those of those models, the deployment of those models, the entire security architecture around that. But the third piece that you're involved in, I think is very interesting. And it's, I think the additional way at the outset, as I said this, that as a security practitioner, you have to think about Gen AI. You can't just think about how to secure it. I think if you're proactive and forward leaning on this, you also have to think, where can I gain advantages from? How can I leverage that in security operations. So maybe describe a little bit up about the particular service line you're uh, leading. Right, so once you secure your model, uh, now you can actually operationalize it with the use of AI. And we focus on the six critical functions of cyber defense, which are incident response, threat detection, mission control, security validation, threat intelligence, and threat hunting. And what we ask for our clients who are interested in this is, we would do a cyber defense assessment uh, within 18 months, or we can do it alongside the engagement and see where they're at in their cyber defense capabilities. And then once we get an understanding of you know, where their baselines are, we can actually go in and see where AI can help them in those six uh, functions. And you were one of the authors of the blog we did last year, um, talking about how Gen AI can be usage uh, can be used rather, right? Um, with respect to, I think your particular example was a SOC analyst, right? And decoding a piece of, um, I think it was PowerShell script, if I recall correctly. It was, yeah. Yeah. So, so what are the, some of the examples since then that you found where Gen AI can be useful at solving one of those three T's that we talked about: the threat, toil, talent. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen where it can really plug in? Um, I've seen really good benefits with creating detections, uh, specifically having like a base detection to work off of, or even just improving one that's in your environment. We've also seen, you know, understanding what hunt queries to search for in an environment. You can ask AI, you know, hey, I want to hunt for this specific uh, type of attacker or this type of uh, attack in general, and it can kind of provide some guidance on you know, what to hunt for, maybe what those hunt queries would be, basically what those hunt queries would look like uh, if you were to apply them in your environment. So that's kind of some areas we've seen improvement. I've also just seen it as like a knowledge base too. So when you do investigations in an IR setting, you know, sometimes if you're like new to security or you just don't know what to look for or where to pivot off of, uh, we've also seen it be used as like knowledge repository. So if you don't know where to look for certain artifacts or what else to investigate during an incident, you can use AI to basically help guide you. I know for me, like I don't know all the event IDs and I don't have it memorized as well. So, you know, asking Janai to help you with those types of questions or, you know, maybe what registry keys to look for next are some great benefits of AI. There seems to be, I mean, we talk about again, Three T's: threat, toil, talent. I, I've seen a lot of different use cases where the toil and talent almost kind of overlap. You know, so there could be a task, and I think maybe some of the ones you referenced, um, where it could be very, you could maybe finally accomplish that that thing that you're doing that you're working on, but it could take a lot of work. And similarly, if you are a newer, you know, security practitioner or you're newer to a particular facet of security work, you can get up to speed maybe more quickly by leveraging that back and forth, you know, with a chat bot or something like that. Have you seen some sort of examples like that where those two kind of merge together, the toil and talent? I have. So 
you know, when we talk about this service line, we want to address a lot of the common challenges that security analysts face. So, you know, we're talking about repetition of tasks, so doing things over and over again, you know, streamlining that. So, you know, maybe an analyst can focus on improving themselves or focus on more important things that are going on during an incident. But like you said, reducing the amount of toil, you know, for me, when I was a SOC analyst, I got burned out really quickly. And by having, you know, AI do the repetition for you, it kind of allows you to focus on other things and kind of get motivated again as an analyst. When you look at um, or you've seen some of the hindrances or some of the friction points for security organizations as they're looking to adopt Gen AI, specifically for security, right? So leaving aside the other parts of the enterprise, what are some commonalities you see? What are some of the, the typical hindrances um, or issues that maybe crop up when an organization is approaching that topic? Uh, I find that, you know, there's a couple. They are just unfamiliar with how to use AI or they're scared to use it. So, you know, I think a lot of folks are scared that their data is going to get leaked. You know, we hear about it in the news all the time about how such and such company had their data leaked due to an employee using AI. You know, we want people to use AI, but we want to use it. We want them to use it securely. So, you know, like the two other service lines we talked about today, you know, hopefully a client would go through those types of services before they start op operationalizing it. Uh, some other, I guess, hindrances that we see is they just don't understand the capabilities or they don't know what prompts to use to get the right outputs. So, you know, hopefully with this service line, we kind of guide them on, you know, how they can use it, where it could benefit them. And uh, maybe in the future, we could even help them on, you know, what prompts to use, stuff like that. And are there any sort of kind of precursors in their security maturity that they typically need to have before they would, you know, bring in this particular service? Or where do you typically start start that journey? Um, it would be probably in the beginning when we do the cyber defense assessment. Hopefully, uh, we do hope that clients are a bit mature, uh, especially those that are looking for this type of service, just because... Um, you know, we need them to have processes already created for us to work off of or improve upon. Excellent. Well, I think this is a great, you know, sort of um, overview of the ways the consulting team, you guys are all approaching uh, Gen AI and security. Uh, I would say, again, from a very holistic standpoint, um, everything from the security of Gen AI uh, models, training data, testing that, uh, but then also adopting and using this in the security context. Any sort of, as we wrap up here, any final thoughts around this? So one one thing I did want to state here is, and it's it's probably going to be a little bit repetitive because the point was made before, but just building off what, what Trisha described there, for a lot of these organizations that are looking at adopting these technologies to make it part of the workflow. So for example, using Copilot or Gemini or any of these other LLMs that are part of the development lifecycle, there needs to be a process through which the organization is able to, number one, ensure that employees are doing it in a secure fashion, but also for them to actually understand what the risks are of the employees using those tools. So for example, Trisha talked about data leakage. If that is something that is a high enough risk for organizations, first develop your controls, first understand how you would actually mitigate that risk before you sort of dive headfirst into adopting these technologies. Now, again, Right now, it is a little bit of a race where some organizations, the early adopters, have sort of, they have rushed into it. And I don't mean rushed into it in a negative fashion, but rather that they have gone ahead and they've adopted it. And now they're trying to figure out what the risks look like. Other organizations are being a little bit more conservative in the sense that they're trying to ask those questions, the tough questions first. They're holding their teams back to say, we need to understand what the risks are, what, what the mitigations are. So the point I'm trying to make there is the governance and framework aspect really helps in that adoption process. At least it helps you start asking those right questions to say, what does this mean for our organization? Especially when we're using these uh, LLMs, it's, it's important for us to understand the difference between these tools, right? So what is an LLM versus what is something that has machine learning on the back end that is able to generate certain data back uh, out to, to uh, employees or users of that tool? So when it comes to that privacy considerations, uh, data access, data protection, all those elements need to be addressed before we start uh, adopting these tools. 
So to me, for an organization, if they're starting to look at adopting these tools or have already adopted these tools and they haven't asked these questions, uh, it, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's never too late to start asking these questions, but if you haven't, should start. Muhammad, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I think race to adoption of these types of solutions, it feels like I alluded to earlier, like where we were in the early 2000s. Um, we got through it then. We'll get through it now. Back then, one in 10 of my clients had a firmly documented uh, program in place for patch config and vulnerability management. Now every organization does. I think as we see broader adoption of these solutions, more and more organizations will start with that type of philosophy first. I'd like to think that we learned something through that Wild West period in the early 2000s. And I think we'll get through uh, this this Wild West period in, in a very similar way. I, I concur with, with Pat there. Like we have this muscle memory. Some organizations don't realize that we do have this muscle memory, exactly like you said, from the early 2000s when the cloud came up. Uh, and we're just helping organizations realize we're asking exactly the same questions, it's just applying it to a slightly different application here. And going back to like the early adoption, you know, we're seeing a lot of tools now integrate AI uh, into all sorts of different tools. I know Google has that already done in their security tools already. And, you know, if SOX can get on that quickly and learn how to use AI with just their everyday tasks, then I think, you know, it'll help them out tremendously. And, you know, SOC analysts can focus on the more important things. All right, I'll just close uh, by saying uh, we'll include a link in the show notes to where people can go uh, find out more about any of these services uh, today. And Mohammed, Pat, Tricia, thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Luke. Thank you. It's our pleasure, Luke. Thank you.